Yes, I was at USC. Uh, I graduated in 2006. Uh, and at that same year, I started that game company with my partner, Kelly Santiago. We were both graduate from the Film School Interactive Media Program. Uh, so TGC has been existing you know, for six years so far. Uh, we were very lucky uh, through a series of events. We worked with Sony on a three-game contract. Uh, so in the past six years, uh, we've made three games on the PlayStation 3, uh, Flow, Flower, and Journey. I will talk to them a little bit later. Um, but, you know, we have actually, for a very small studio, you know, with about 10 people, we've won a lot of awards in the past. Um, and as a game company, we were surprisingly um, noticed by a lot of uh, press that is not really in the game. Um, so a lot of people were saying, hey, you know, like, what's, what's the secret sauce behind your company? Um, well, I, I think I, I, would, I think would say there was passion, but you know, actually in the game industry, pretty much everybody who works there have passion for games. Uh, I think the, the real reason our company is slightly different than the others is that we have a very unique vision. Uh, and to explain this vision, I want to tell you a little bit about my past. Uh, so I grew up in China. Uh, particularly, I grew up in Shanghai. Uh, Shanghai is a very big, big city. I think it's about 30 million people. Uh, so as I remember, in trying to think about what happened in my days in China, um, there's a lot of competition. Um, and because of competition, it's very busy. And unfortunately, the 22 years I've spent in China, I didn't quite figure out what I want to do. Um, so I, I started like to draw something when I was very young. Uh, and I really enjoyed doing it. Uh, I think that might be you know, really naturally what I want. But um, you know, spending my early days with my grandma, uh, my, both of my parents work. So my grandma took me uh, basically up to maybe age five or six. Uh, this is my cousin. So you can see I'm very happy back then. Uh, there's a lot of love, uh, a lot of care, and I can do whatever I want. And then I go to live with my parents, uh, and you can already sense the pressure there. Uh, uh, so, you know, uh, I grew up as part of the generation where I'm the only child, you know, uh, due to the government's law. But, you know, in a traditional Chinese family, there are different roles for the different kids, you know, all the siblings, you know. Uh, but, you know, being the, being the single child, which means, you know, I have to do all of them. And I can't fail because, you know, that's all my parents is counting on. So my life started to become very busy. Uh, my dad was a typical, typical Chinese, uh, I would say scholar, uh, even though he's not working in university. Uh, he grew up in a very poor family. Uh, through very hard working, you know, the, the, the CAT test in China was very, very competitive. He actually failed twice, so he stayed in home working on it for the third time, and then he became the number one in his province, went to Peking, Peking University. So that's the most proud of things he ever had in his life. And so for him, when he think about a good future for his son, he, he basically think about, you need to do the same thing. Uh, so at a very young age, he took me to Beijing, which we didn't go to the Great Wall. We went to Be uh, Be Beida, Beijing University, and Tsinghua, and that's the only two places we went. <laughs> and so basically he was saying, you know, you should become a professor in the future, which I don't know what that's about. But at the time, I really liked to draw, so I'm thinking about is going back to doodle. Uh, so in 1991, that is a time when personal computing, uh, personal computer become finally something you can afford at home. Uh, and Chairman Dunn had a quote says, if you want to learn computer, you better start training them from kids. Uh, and so my dad happened to be actually involved in one of the early generation of computers in the government. So he was thinking that's the, new, that's the future. And in 1991, when I was about 10 years old, at the time, I still go to art school. You know, after the normal class, I would go to uh, art school, learn how to draw. My dad 
basically said you should go you should not go to art school anymore. You should go to computer school. And that's the first time where I really doubted about whether my life is about becoming a professor. Um, I remember I was crying and he was dragging me all the way to this place called Children Palace in Shanghai. Uh, and they happened to have the, the earliest program to teach you how to program. And so this is the 1991 I was sitting there and you can see how old this computer looked like. Uh, so basically, I thought computers were going to be this terrible thing, but when I turned on the computers, I realized there's actually computer games. And there's very artistic things in there, and that's very interesting looking. Um, and uh, I, I, I was fascinated. So, you know, like, even though the first time I was crying going to the computer school, later I just, you know, like, it, it's about a 45 minutes walk, but I walked to computer school very happily because of the games. Um, and it was also the first time I was probably 12, I was thinking about making my own game. Uh, but my career quickly ended because the disc I was working on is damaged. You know, the floppy disk, they damage all the time. Uh, and it was not very easy for people to get into a game making career. Uh, this is the class, and you can see half of the kids are sleeping. Uh, I'm there. Uh, so the reason, you know, if you understand Chinese, she's writing basically uh, a recursive algorithm. Any of, uh, any of you guys learn computer programming? I mean, it's probably the most boring thing ever you can, you can imagine you know, for these kids to learn at such a young age. So I was more kind of mesmerizing about the art school I went to and the kids who joined. Um, in order to, I mean, as a result, I'm not very good at computer programming. I'm probably middle to last in the class. So in 1995, my dad felt, you know, he has to do something to stir my interest in computers. So he bought a computer. That was a big investment back then. You know, nobody else owned a computer. So as a result, I do spend more time with it. But I spend more time going around, go to all the computer market, trying to pirate all the games and bring them back so I can play it. The early days of pirating is very cool. You just bring a disk and you copy a disk and then bring it home. Uh, it wasn't quite illegal back then. Uh, <laughs> uh, but as a result, you know, being the only kid who owned a computer at, at such a young age, uh, I played a lot of games. I would probably say, I dare to say, I play more games than anywhere on earth at that era because of piracy. You know, American kids can't afford all those games. Uh, so I play a lot of games. And I certainly become the guru of gaming, you know, among the kids. And this is, this is probably when I was in college, and here's my cousins, you know. Like, game become such an important part of my life. I make a lot of friends through game. Um, and actually, uh, one particular game I really want to bring up, uh, are you guys familiar with this? Uh, the English name is the... Uh, the Legend of Swords and Fairy. Uh, this is a game that only Chinese people know because it's in chi Chinese. But um, about millions of players in China who played this game cried uh, for the game. Um, I want to say uh, something special because um, part of the reason people cry for this is that at the time, nobody are expecting a video game are going to tell you a touching story. Nobody is expecting a game is going to be, you know, talk about sacrifice, love, and all these things. Even though the story um, back then, you know, it, it's just basically the dialogue. You know, uh, my parents have a very strict control of what books I read. They are so afraid I will be addicted to reading novels, so I wouldn't study hard. <laughs> so they don't give me read books. And they don't let me watch in, uh, any TV that is uh, kind of mature, right? So they only want me to watch cartoon. So which the only thing they don't have control was game. So if you can imagine, uh, the very first medium I've ever consumed, which really touched me, is actually a game and how powerful that is. You know, when you have your first catharsis and you really cry, you feel the, uh, the heart-wrenching you know, ache in there. Somehow, after this experience, I felt I'm a better person. Um, 
It is very strange, you know. If you watch something very, very moving, and you, there's this strange emptiness, and you start questioning what just happened, you know, I start to question myself. You know, who am I? Why am I here? Why am I living? What is the right way of living? And it was such a powerful experience that I, I somehow start to wish that, I wish one day maybe I can make something that just basically do that for others. Uh, make their life better. Um, but, you know, I don't have a chance to do it because life is very busy and competitive. So back in high school, um, I was in this very special class which, you know, they only pick 40 people in the entire city. Uh, so everyone here was some kind of champion or medalist when they were in mid middle high school. Um, and this is my class. Um, and there's about 45 people. This is actually the second year. So uh, slowly, every semester, the very last few, you know, fellows, two or three, they will be kicked out of class. And they will go to the normal class, what we call, you know, we are the elite class. And these people are being called losers, and the normal class are not welcoming them. And so a lot of them are my friends. But what happened is, at the end of each semester, right after the final exam, we will be, you know, right after the final exam, we would already know what the final answer is. So we know what our score is. And so I remember every semester, I would be talking to various guys, trying to get an idea how much score they lost. So I would be counting, okay, this guy is worse than me, this guy is worse than me. Okay, so there's three of them, so I'm safe because I'm always in the middle and to the last. So this is a very, very competitive class. I don't have a lot of friends. People don't like each other. Um, but through game, I made about four friends because we all love games. And, but you know, outside school, my dad still was pushing me for the computer programming com competitions. Um, so I don't really have time to think about making games or making experience to touch people. And eventually, uh, through all these years of work, I did win some award. Uh, what I want to say is these kids here, even though they are all you know, winning awards, they are all very strange. They are like me. Actually, in fact, these two guys that happen to be my classmates in college. And this is my roommate. And this guy, he's not here, but he's actually in USC today. Uh, he's a professor now. Um, what I thought was very interesting is people were saying, oh, you know, they were telling my dad, oh, your son won the awards, he must be a talent, you know, in computer programming. But I know myself, I don't like computer programming. Um, to me, I think it's an unfair game because I've been learning computers since 10 years old. So by the time I'm competing, I have 10 years experience of uh, computer programming. But most kids start learning maybe only for a couple of years. So, I'm not really that good, but I can still win. But is this competition really worthwhile? Uh, eventually, I didn't go to Beijing University to the disappointment of my dad. I went to uh, Jiao Tong University uh, because my high school is affiliated with the university. So I was in this kind of like direct transport uh, program. So you can see the dormitory is almost the same. You know, I, I just thought, geez, you know, I'm going to continue doing this for four more years. Um, and the only difference is that actually my parents are no longer around me, right? And all of a sudden, you know, there's no more, there's no more requirement from them. The, the, the school is not pushing us anymore. While we, I was in high school, the school is all about, you know, you want to get high score so you can bring honor to the school. But when you're in college, nobody cares, so I felt like I was liberated. Uh, and, you know, as any kid who suddenly, you know, break free, they, they waste their first two years just doing random things and play a lot of games. Uh, so be, I was basically in a computer program, but I couldn't care less about programming. So I spent my entire college basically uh, escaping from computer classes and fail a lot of classes. Uh, went to audit art school classes, even though I'm not their major. Um, did a lot of uh, photography and martial arts. Well, that's not really art, but uh, 
I did self-taught my uh, a lot of like digital uh, software to learn how to paint and draw and design uh, 3D animations. And that it was during those era, uh, I watched a lot of film by Pixar and Studio Ghibli. Uh, and as you know, these movies are very good. And it really makes me feel like I, I, you know, I really wish I could do something just like those directors to, to move people. Uh, so while I was in the college, I, I did a lot of uh, computer graphics. You know, that's in the early 90s. Well, maybe late in the 90s. Um, and I, I realized I was actually pretty good. <laughs> uh, and because of that uh, and my interest in game, there was this club in the university called Game Making Club. Uh, and we actually kind of stayed during the summer holiday and worked on these games while I was in school. But at the time, I didn't really thought I'm going to be, become a game developer because my parents have been telling me ever since I, I've I was 10 years old, the game is nothing serious, you know, you should do something real. So it's kind of like if I tell them I wanted to become a game designer, it's trying to tell them I want to be, uh, uh, you know, a pornography, you know, the director or something. Like it's just not, it's not something I was thinking. So when we graduated, this is my roommate, actually this guy was also in a word, he actually became the, the international uh, computer programming champion. Uh, of ACM, I think. Uh, but you know, like we all went to the same program, and he's actually interested in programming. He continued programming even when he was in college. But I was like, I don't like programming. I just did all the art. Uh, and you know, upon graduation, one of them is married. Uh, some, uh, someone else, actually, a lot of my uh, classmates were saying, you know, like, what is the successful result of Chinese college, which is find a high salary job, and it's pretty much down to like whoever is paying more that's, more, that's basically more successful. Looking back today, I think that was really dumb, but actually at the time I believed in it. Um, so I really don't know what to do because uh, I have three job offers, one from a game company, one from Microsoft, and one from an advertisement company. And I couldn't decide what to do. And so I did the norm, which is like most of the Chinese students, just travel to the West, you know, get a degree and figure out later. Uh, and my experience in USC was, is so important that completely reshaped my career and my future. Uh, I went to the cinema school. They have really cool labs. Uh, but more, more importantly, they actually taught, you know, cinema, which was not something I was ever considered, but I think now it's the most important knowledge I've gained while I was studying in the interactive media program. Um, and the other thing nice about grad school is that, you know, in our professor's words, is you paid so much money, so you have this free time where you can actually do things you care about, and you can, you have time to think about what you want. Um, and what I would want, you know, really come up to be clear during this era. Um, because as I study, I have realized there's a frustration in me. <laughs> the frustration is that, you know, with all these games I played, I'm playing less and less game every year. And it, the game has just stopped becoming interesting to me. Uh, Fifteen years ago, uh, did you guys play this game? Uh, right? And... Uh, my dad was saying, hey, you should go to sleep. I said, dad, no, I'm doing something serious here. I'm learning how to drive. <laughs> uh, but, you know, like this year, I mean, there's all these Formula One games. They look very realistic, but I don't care about them anymore. Uh, this is probably 12 years ago, you know, the first uh, kind of Nazi killing game where I was very scared when I see those Nazis. But... You know, now I'm just killing Nazi like zombies. You know, I, I'm just mindlessly rolling them over, and I don't really like to play for, uh, World War II game anymore. It's probably I play too many of them. Uh, today's game technologically is more advanced. Uh, people will say it's more real, it's more engaging, and it's more satisfying. Some people even went out of way to say, "Hey, game is actually good for kids because they teach them some basic mathematics, economics. You know, they." practice their hand-eye coordination, and they teach them about physics, you know, a lot of physics in games. 
But I would argue that the uh, toys does them as well. Uh, but you know, for adults, if you're you know still playing kids' toys, it's kind of funny. Uh, and in fact, a lot of my friends uh, who I grew up with, who you know play games with, including my cousins, they don't play games anymore. You know, well, games are for kids. And they all, all, all the, they will say, oh, you know, I just don't have time to play them. You know, it, it's too time consuming. Oh, it's too addicting. I just don't want to, you know, play them anymore. And it's really sad because this is something which defined my life. You know, I grew up with it. I had so much love with it. You know, it's my first emotional experience. I really don't want to see game to become a toy. Uh, so I really wish that game can be interesting to, to adults. Uh, and in the industry, people are saying, yeah, of course, we're targeting adults. We're adding more mature content. Uh, and you know, it's either this kind of mature content or that kind of mature content. But I think they're for intellectually immature adults. Uh, and there are all these games you know, that they are great for kids. You know, yeah, you know, uh, like reading a little uh, fairy tale story. Um, but I'm craving for a game that is not only good for kids, but also is relevant for adults. Um, meanwhile, my friends are still reading their book. They're still watching the movies, you know, even though they don't have time to play the game. You know, they're still participating in real games you know, in life. And you know, it's, it's just kind of frustrating that they, they don't like video games anymore. And this frustration become the drive. Um, and, but I don't know what to do. Um, the real calling came from one of the projects I worked on at the grad school. Um, basically, uh, in the interactive media program, we have uh, a grant called Gaming Innovation Grant. So in year 2005, uh, I and a, stu uh, a student team worked on this game, uh, which is trying to be the very opposite of uh, what video game is in the mainstream media, because this is what mainstream media think video game is. Uh, so, in trying to be the opposite, we kind of accidentally stepped into a very interesting space. Uh, we're trying to focus on a game that has nothing to do with violence or stress. We want to make a game about everybody's childhood daydream, about being able to fly. You know, being able to interact with the wonderful and magical clouds. Um, and eventually, the, the game Cloud it was born. This is actually a shirt made back then, you know, seven years old shirt. Uh, so what is Cloud? Uh, Cloud is basically a boy who was sick in the hospital, so he couldn't go out to play with others. Uh, he looked out the window and fantasizing he can fly out like a bird and fly into the beautiful blue sky and white clouds. Uh, so this is the graphics that's made by the student team. Uh, so it's, it's very rough and raw. Uh, so you're in the sky, you can fly by the clouds. You can grab them, you can drag them, you can use them to draw. Uh, and you can use them to create rain to claim the pollution and maybe put out a volcano file. That's kind of just wild, wild ideas. Uh, so here you can see the game. You know, it's a student game. The main reason I'm showing you is uh, basically to show you how the character doesn't even have animation. It's just like multiple frames skipping. Uh, it, it is just to show how simple the game is and how crappy it is because it's a student project. <laughs> uh, but to our surprise, this game, uh, once we launched in three weeks, uh, it actually brought down the school server. Uh, <laughs> You know, like the USC server is down because all these people are downloading this 40 megabytes PC installation. And that was 2005. Would you want to download a 40 megabytes install in your PC? That's like a, a malware. Uh, but uh, the local TV channel is talking about it. it was in the Australian newspaper. And some Japanese fans even say they, they cried for this game, which, you know, I, I find it's hard to believe. But, you know, like being working on it so long, I couldn't really get that experience, you know, the first time playing it. Uh, but I start to get emails and emails. I was thinking, you know, I, before this game, I've made 12 games. Nobody ever write to me. But, you know, this particular line was interesting. Tell everyone involved that they are beautiful people. Growing up my entire life, nobody told me that I'm a beautiful person. 
So I really think there is something interesting in this project that is setting it apart from anything I worked on. Uh, I think I spent about half a year to trying to analyze what went right. Uh, and I realized there's a new continent in the land of innovation for video games. And the continent is called emotion. Um, okay, so you know, when we are hungry, we seek for food, and there's an entire food industry. When we are thirsty, we look, look for something to drink and look how, how much variety things we can drink. And what about a person is hungry for a feeling, right? A feeling for happiness, sadness, uh, sarcasm, seriousness, you know, uh, anything. A wide range of emotion. What do they do then? Well, from the ancient society to the modern world, everybody has some time in their life that they really feel down, they need some emotional supplements, right? Uh, and this desire for emotions drives what I think is the entertainment industry. You know, you know, entertainment to me is just basically the food industry for feeling. You know, and we need a wide variety of them. Uh, you know, and whether it's reading a very inspiring book, uh, whether it's to feel the thrill, uh, just being thrown around, but but screaming as loud as you can, because in normal life you don't have that opportunity to have that emotion. Uh, or watching a cinema, they are all entertainment. Uh, and if you look at you know, established mediums such as film uh, and look at the genre and think about what they make you feel, you know, from the negative to positive, they have a wide variety to cover it. So people don't really say, are you a film watcher? Right? They just say, oh, what kind of mood are you in to watch a film? Right? What kind of film do you like? Um, but for video games, people are still say, oh, are you a gamer or not? Because video game has a very narrow emotional coverage in terms of the entire spectrum of humanity. Well, you know, like most of games are very primal emotions, you know, like uh, excitement, uh, violence, competition, uh, thrill. Uh, but I have yet to play a game that makes you feel romantic, intimate, uh, give you, you know, a, a, what a documentary will make you feel. Um, and I believe, um, Part of the reason my friends stop playing game is that we need different kind of emotional content as we grow up. So when I was really young, as a teenager, I like to have power fantasy because my parents are forcing me to do things, my school is forcing me to do things, I could not do things I want. So if you look at Japanese manga, they have manga for teenagers, boys. It actually is exactly the same as American comic which is exactly the same as video game, which is you are the superhero, you have the superpower, you can do anything you want, you can change the world. Uh, but now I'm old. I don't need power anymore. I have power, you know, I have a company. But, you know, the power comes with responsibility. And life is much, much more complex than what I imagined when I was a teenager. And I want something that is more intellectual, something that is more relevant. But games are not providing that. Uh, but there are so much, so much space and out there the games could be. And if we can actually make game provide various emotions, then it will become a healthy industry. And that will be the future where people don't ask you, are you a gamer or not? They just say, hey, what kind of mood are you in? Let's play some games. Um, so um, I, I graduated from USC and I had this three game deal with Sony. The very first thing I worked on is trying to solve an accessibility problem. This might be kind of a little bit uh, counterintuitive because I was talking about emotion and then all of a sudden I'm talking about accessibility. Uh, what happened is when we had cloud, you know, even though we have so many emails asking us you know, how great the game is, but a lot of emails are saying, hey, you know, I'm 45 years old, I don't know how to play this game, can you explain to me, like, what, what are you supposed to do here, what is the control? I was like, this is the same control as World of Warcraft, 10 million people play it, don't you know how to use con the control? And the fact is, many people who come to play these games are not gamers, they don't have the basic knowledge about how to control the game. And so, when I was actually close to graduate, my professor would say, hey, you know, you should just 
turning your cloud game into your thesis and focusing on write about emotion. I said, no, I want to do a thesis that can make a game better for people who never play games. And so I started to research on figuring out a uh, design philosophy that can adapt to people who have played a lot of games and people who never play any game. And so many people point me to this book, uh, Flow, The Psychology of Optimal Experience. Have any one of you familiar with flow theory? Okay, two. So I guess I have to talk about this a little bit. Flow theory is actually a very, very important theory. So it's basically a positive psychology, which is, you know, in the past, psychology is always about what makes these people mad, you know, what makes these people misbehave. But only until recently, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, this is a psychology professor from Chicago, University of Chicago, um, he started to research on what makes people happy, what makes people focus, what makes people creative. Um, and so I actually used a theory from the book, uh, Design a Game, and which up to today has been played by six million people. Um, so the basic idea of flow theory is that, you know, for any activity you engage, you know, this is actually often used in training and education. Let's say there's an athlete. He is performing a running or maybe jumping. And his skill will grow, his ability will grow as he practices more and more. But if you don't make the practice more challenging, eventually he will just feel bored. Uh, well, so let's imagine if the challenge doesn't grow, but his ability keep growing, he will leave this kind of like the optimal area called flow zone. He will become bored. Uh, but if the challenge raises too high before his ability can catch up, then he will fail, and there will be too much frustration that he will just give up. So as a coach. You want to make sure to create a balance between the new challenge and the, the athlete's ability. Um, so what my design uh, methodology is about uh, is actually from a real case in a high school. So in a high school, there's all these kids trying to jump over the pool during the, the, the PE class. I don't know if it's called PE. I didn't went to high school here. But, um, but you know, like in a class, there will be kids who are really weak. You know, he, who couldn't jump over that high, but then there would be kids who's really strong. They're like, this is easy case. So both the kids feel, one kids feel bored, one kids feel frustrated. And eventually the, the teacher invented a new way to engage the students. He basically put the pool tilted. Uh, and all of a sudden, as a kid, you have the option to jump from the left or the right. And so, you know, the weaker kids jump from the left and they, they jumped over, they have a sense of accomplishment. The kids on the right, they jumped over as well, but they, they felt that, you know, they, they challenged themselves. And once all the kids jumped over the pool, they raised the pool still, but tilted. And all of a sudden, the entire class enjoyed uh, this activity. So that's basically what I do for games. Uh, basically, by offer a wide variety of choices so that the, the user can customize their own challenge based on the in-game choices, so that they will always stay in the zone and stay engaged with the game. Uh, so here's actually a trailer of Flow. So in a game, you are this little underwater microorganism. And you, you go around consume other organisms, and you grow yourself, you know, that's your ability growing. Uh, by eating this red organism, they can, you, they, you can dive deeper into the ocean, which become more dangerous. There's other creatures that might be hostile. Uh, and if you feel it's too challenging, you can eat uh, a blue food, which will bring you back to the, to the shallower area in the water. So you're always in control of how much challenge you want to engage. Um, a lot of people spend hours and hours playing this game on, on my browser. And they were saying this is this is a very uh, very dangerous game because it's uh, it's a it's, it just you know time just flies by which you know basically is a sign of you're in the flow. Um, so you know both a lot of gamers play this game and a lot of people who never play games actually play this experience on the on the website. Um, I realized you know like that approach works. 
Uh, and finally, I have the opportunity to come back for the subject of emotion, but this time I want to do it right because I, I don't want those people who never played games to write email to me, ask me to how to explain to play the game. I don't want to do it anymore. So, Flower is uh, the second game where I try to combine both accessibility and emotion. Um, so, I mentioned I grew up in China. Uh, I happen to be not very into traveling, so I spent most of my years in the same city, the same district. I didn't go to the wild. You know, I didn't go to any other places. You know, the only other places I went to are cities. So when I first came to California, uh, I was driving on the I-5 from LA to San Francisco, and I was seeing all these green, endless rolling hills, also a stinky uh, cow farm. But uh, <laughs> anyway, so I, I saw these rolling hills and all the windmill farm. I was like, oh my god, this looks like the Windows wallpaper. Uh, so. <laughs> So I stopped my car, I went around, and I was, you know, I was basically standing in the field, look around, you know, it's just green, you know, all around me. And that was so overwhelming. It's like some guy who never seen the ocean first time he went to the beach. That's kind of like how I felt. Uh, and I thought, you know, this is such a great experience. I want to capture this to share with my family and friends. Uh, so I took this photo. And this photo is probably maybe 20 degree field of view, you, you know. It's not 360. So I start to do panorama video, I just do this, right? And that doesn't capture it if you watch it. So I start to think, well, uh, I do art, maybe I can use artistic exaggeration to capture the feeling. Uh, so I start to do painting, but there's something missing. I do more painting, uh, more painting about the nature and the fields. I realized, actually, uh, I added this. this. This was not there. This, this is not in the field. Uh, there's a little city here. That was not in the field. So I start to realize, as I draw more and more, if I don't add a little house or a city there, it, it was magical first, but after a while it felt like an exile. Because what's my home? It's, it's insecure. It's like, where is this place? Um, but the first five minutes was wonderful. And I realized it's kind of ironic because I grew up in a city. I have a strong craving towards nature, but I can't really live purely in the nature anymore because city is my home. And so eventually I realized that I was not trying to capture the nature. I was trying to capture the nature while I'm actually at home and while I'm actually still bonded to the city. It's maybe it's because I'm ho homesick, because Shanghai is a metropolitan city with all the sky rising and everybody who's walking on the street, but in LA, you know, it's the opposite. You don't see a person on the street. Uh, so I really miss home, and I wanted to capture both the city experience and the nature. So um, basically learning from the flow experience, we want to make the control as simple as possible so any kids or older you know, people can actually grasp the complexity of, you know, the PlayStation it has like 20 buttons on it, but our game doesn't even require a button press. Uh, the game is very simple, so here is actually uh, a kid who is playing a game, but uh, this kid has Down syndrome problem. Do you know what Down syndrome is? Um, basically, his intelligence just developed much slower than other people, and so his brother shot this video of him playing the game because he was surprised that his, his brother can actually play it, you know, it, which is you know, very, very uh, surprising for him. So the game is very simple by tilting the controller. It's kind of like you know, the, the motion sensor in your phone these days. Basically, you're controlling a gust of wind, uh, bringing the flower, flower petal uh, to you know, kind of blow them towards random directions. Um, and so here is more like an in-game uh, zoomed in video. Uh, so as you collect these petals by blooming the flower, you can turn them into uh, a force of life. Um, so you can deposit the flower petal. Um,
basically just you know you, you you go around you you bring life to the world you make the world a better place and as you go you realize that you're not just in the wild you're getting closer and closer to a city and this is more like a video footage from a city I turn out the, the sound because there's guys commenting on, on the gaming play gameplay experience which is kind of annoying uh, <laughs> Uh, so you can see, you know, like you bring all the life in the city. You you wash the dirty building. You you recolorize them. It's a it's very kind of like uh, a liberating experience. By the time you eventually reach the city, uh, and this game is all about positive emotion because uh, at the time the media was saying how games are violent, games are destructive, games are making the kids. Uh, Basically, it's all the cause because the kids are violent and you know reckless driving all these things, which I don't believe in. But I thought, what if I make a game? Well, in the entire game, you're doing positive things. You're making what a better place. And whether after the game, you you wanted to continue that experience into the real life, um, and it was very simple concepts. But it's actually very hard to to accomplish uh, because while we're developing the game. Uh, our publisher Sony was like, you know, can you add some fun to this game? This game is too boring. You know, you're just flying the field, and it's not challenging enough. You know, it's if it's not challenging, it's not fun. So we actually tried a lot of gameplay uh, prototype where there is challenge, um, and it is really fun. The problem is uh, when it is really fun, it's challenging. If you barely made it, but then you missed it, you know, it's any kind of activity, people start to curse. Uh, even if you actually barely made it, people still curse. You know, <laughs> fuck yeah, right? Uh, and that's just not what I want the experience to be like. You know, I want it to be peaceful, to be harmony. It's about the nature and, and the beauty of the city. So we actually tried 12 different prototypes, which is kind of insane because we spent two years working on the game. We spent 14 months on trying prototypes. Um, if this was a normal production, you will already be canceled. Your project is canceled. You don't even know what you're doing. Um, and basically, that's about 75% of, of, of our man months went to R&D. And I realized how difficult it is to make a game that is not like something that's already existed because you have nothing to reference to. You're basically searching the fog. Uh, so here's an uh, emotional chart of the entire game. Uh, this is actually based on what I learned from the film school. It's a three-act structure because we want to create a very cathartic climax in the end. If the game just directly goes straight up, eventually you'll be bored. So you need to create a low moment so that the, the rise can be much, much higher. So it's a very typical Hollywood a classic structure I learned from the film school, the screenwriting class. And I apply it to games, and it works so well. Actually, a lot of people cried for flower. Uh, I have over 300 emails from worldwide just basically talking, telling us how moved they are, how the game reminds them of you know, their family, their parents, their kids. Um, but one thing about executing uh, this, this particular uh, direction, what I realized is that when I work with artists who work in the game, it's very easy to say, hey, can you give me an experience that is kind of low, that's kind of depressing? He can draw a painting very quickly. I talk to a composer. Can you give me a music that is very depressing, but not too depressing because we still want people to continue? He can play it right off the keyboard. But when I talk to game designers, including myself, hey, can we come up with a gameplay that is so sad, so depressing, that's not fun at all, but still people want to continue? We don't know. There's nothing like that. There's nothing to reference. So we, we have to try and, and try. And I realized, you know, in, in the academic of video game, which is mostly about interactive design, the vocabulary for interactive de design is very limited. It's a, such a new field. Uh, designers in the industry only know how to design a game that is fun and cool and empowering, but they don't really know how to design a game that's, you know, about spreading love and, you know, romantic feeling. Uh, so in the end, Flower was really successful. Uh, it was played by two years old. Uh, this is probably four, maybe nine. 
teenagers, some guy at Wall Street Journal playing it. Um, <laughs> and Flower was actually, surprisingly, was invited by an uh, uh, art exhibition. This is in Shanghai MoCA. It was also in Belgium. It's basically part of the interactive art installation. And I, I'm really proud because, you know, uh, before the show started, you know, I was basically there installing the stuff. And I realized all the security guards are gone. Nobody's guarding the door because all the security guards is playing flower, you know, <laughs> in the same room. Uh, and so Fl Flow and Flower was also part of the Smithsonian Museum. Uh, recently, they curated a show called The Art of Video Game. And here's a bunch of people playing flower. Um, and you can see, you know, women, kids, you know, senior, you know, people, they all play the game and they, they don't have a problem interacting with it. Um, so now let me move to, oh, geez, it's already 1025. OK, so this is, this is the latest game, Journey. Um, and this is the time where I wanted to do something between people. Uh, for a long period of time, video game has been about single player experience because there's no networking. And the computer become, uh, they, they start to simulate the other players you play with. You know, when a game first existed, it's always about people and people interaction. Uh, the problem today is that these online games people are playing is all about killing each other or kill something together. Uh, and so I, I, I kind of wanted to, to change that, to bring what I did with Flow and Flower to what happened to people interaction over the internet. So I had a very interesting inspiration uh, actually from one of the alumni here. Actually, I don't know if he's an alumni, but he's, uh, he's on the board of uh, trustees. Uh, so I realized um, what happened is in our life today, uh, we are so empowered. We can move and travel at 60 miles per hour, sometimes more if you want to. Um, and we can live in the sky. We can talk to anybody at anywhere at any time. Life is so empowering. Um, and everybody have access to you know, the most trusted source you know, uh, Wikipedia and all these Google stuff, you know, if you don't know anything, you can search it. You know, it's all in your pocket. Sometimes I felt if you, if you send me back to the 90 when I was 10 years old, if I have access to Wikipedia, I'm basically God. You know, like I know everything, I can do anything. Uh, but it's also kind of interesting, I realized, with such empowerment in our life, I'm also trapped with the empowerment. Uh, so, if you look at video game, which is a pop culture, and if you look at all the characters from the most popular franchise, every single character has something in their hand that represents power. And it's partially because most of the game is about empowerment. Uh, but the gameplay is about acquiring power and executing power to acquire more power. Uh, some people still live like that in real life. Uh, so, so, yeah, uh, Charles F. Bowden Jr. Um, He's a, he's a part of the trustee. Um, I met him during the trustee meeting, and he was talking on a lunch table about how you know, he's been to space three times. He's the space shuttle commander. And he was saying that there's a weird myth, myth uh, among the astronauts group. Basically, everybody who went to the moon, they're, they're usually uh, kind of like very hardcore scientists. They're called mission specialists. You know, and they, they're mostly atheists. And, but, Every single person who went to the moon come back becoming very spiritual. Some people even become like very hardcore Christian, you know, religious. Uh, and they were like, we don't know what happened there. But every single one of them uh, changed. And I said, you know, actually, I, I, I studied uh, psychology. I think I can explain this to you. Basically, um, you know, moon you know, itself does not really feel that special. But when you look at the Earth from the moon, um, it's, they basically told me it's about the size of your thumbnail. And you could cover it, and that's gone. And Earth, you know, all these scientists, everything we know about, you know, like our world, everything on Wikipedia is about this little Earth. But when you are standing on the moon, and you just can't stop thinking, well, what about the rest? 
Why are we here? Why are we only on this planet? Why? There's so many whys that there's a basic emotion of awe. And the emotion of awe is the fundamental thing that drives people to become spiritual. Um, and the problem with today's entertainment media is there's, there's not a lot of awe left. You know, you are the, the center of power, you're the center of information. Typically, you go to a game, you're given a mission, you're given the location of where your mission is, the detail of what you're supposed to do, and you even know what you will get after you complete the mission. It's just like a job. Uh, so the problem is, you know, when you're on a mission, you pass by people. You know, if you're at Wall Street, everybody's so busy, they're watching their phone, they walk by each other, they just ignore each other. They're not in the mindset to actually connect, even socialize. Uh, even when they are fighting zombies together, you know, it's, it's more about killing zombies less than about communicating or connecting with each other. So when I was thinking about how can I create an online game that actually connect people, we have to basically redesign everything from the very foundation of what the gameplay is about. Um, so today, if you play any online game, you will know the very first thing you do is create your own name. And because the game is so competitive, if you went online, most people's name is like, I killed your dad, you know, <laughs> or, you know, no. or, you know, Harry Knuckles. Uh, they, they're just very aggressive because the game they play, right? They want to use their name to be aggressive. Um, so the very first thing is uh, we don't want to show name because that's already created such a negative uh, beginning, you know. It's, it's bad. So we don't want to show that. We actually have an online game where you don't even know what the other people's name is. Uh, we also hide the lobby because uh, today if you want to go online, you have to create a lobby, you have to create a room, you let people join a room and you start the game. But if you give this to a kid, that what is a lobby? I don't want people to ask questions. So the game actually doesn't have lobby. So if you're online, you're connected automatically. Everything is seamless. Um, and because people are so negative and mean online, I don't let them to chat or type. Uh, and, and so this is all very, very counterintuitive. Uh, our publisher was very stressful, you know, because of all these things. But, uh, and the other most important thing is to evoke a sense of small, how small you are, uh, and a sense of wonder. And because I think only when you are in the wild, when you're by yourself, when the entire environment is unknown, you will have a sense of danger, a sense of small. And then when you run into another person, it's not like, I don't care about him, I'm just going to the next point on my GPS. It's like, oh my god, there's another human. I better warn him that I just saw a bear. You know, I just want to say hi. You know, all of a sudden people become more friendly. And so, this is the trailer of Journey. So every player into this game, they wake up in a desert, not knowing who they are, what their mission is, what their task is. They just wake up with no information given to them. And they start to wander in this wild, this, this barren land covered, covered by sand. Uh, very quickly, they will discover, you know, there's a mountain in the distance, which is the only thing that's calling for them. And on their journey, they can go along. They could have a chance to run to someone else. This could be some guy playing in Japan or Russia. You don't know. And it will be traveling together, uh, go through long, long miles, uh, overcome various, you know, challenge, you know, navigate through maze, uh, climb very tall kelps. Um, and eventually, you have to climb an entire mountain to overcome the storm 
and to get to the place. Um, a lot of people describe this game as a very spiritual, uh, they, they sometimes even think this is more like a virtual pilgrimage. Um, but what's special about this game uh, is I actually kind of crafted this whole experience based on uh, Joseph Campbell's work. Do you guys know Joseph Campbell, The Heroes with Southern Faces and the Power of Myth? Uh, in order to create a sense of awe, I basically borrowed the hero's journey, uh, which ended up to be very, very effective. Um, the game launched in March, and so far I've already got 500 emails, more than 500 emails, just telling me all these stories the players felt when they played the game. Um, I'm not going to go through the detail, but you know, on our forum, there's actually a thread called a apologize thread. You know, like all these people who play the game, that but they don't know who the other person is. They are apologizing online, no, hoping that the other person will know, because they left them behind during the journey, which is very rare for these highly testosterone text competitive gamers. Um, but so that's journey. I I I don't really have time to talk about the future. Uh, it's already ten thirty-five. Uh, maybe we should go to Q and A. Okay. Um, I have another question, just a pretty brief comment. Um, it seems to me that when you're talking about the game and the toy, it focuses too much on the identity of the game or gamer. Mm -hmm. I guess as a producer, you better just let it go and uh, um, just forget about you know what it is. No matter it is a game or a toy or a gadget, the matter is not about the name. You, you don't have to verify it. You, the point is that w what, what kind of need it, uh, we're going to meet. And um, sometimes, you know, the identity is just uh, an intellectual illusion. Never mind about it. When you're just uh, creating something, just do it. And right. Uh, Actually, in the game industry, we often say the biggest problem is we call it a game. You know, really, we are working on interactive entertainment. You know, it, it's just, you know, inter inter internet is interactive entertainment. You know, uh, application is interactive experience. Why do we have to call what we do, which is interactive media, you know, as game? Um, I totally agree with you. And the, the philosophy we have at that game company is to analyze what people need uh, emotionally from the market and find what they need the most and make them. And I think that so far has proven to be very successful for us. Okay. Um, I, I remember. Uh, I, I don't think I need to ask that. Really. Um, I remember early in your uh, in your story, you talked about how your parents didn't want you to become addicted to novels. Uh huh. Uh, and recreational reading like that is something that's um, you know, maybe that feeds the hunger for emotion. You know, some people get lost in books because of the arcs of the story. Right. And right. You read a sad book if you want to be sad. You read an adventure book if you want to have an adventure. And so I wonder if. You know, your, it sounds like your creativity was sort of driven by that hunger. Mm -hmm. Do you think that it was something you were like maybe deprived of as a child? And the reason why I ask is because uh, uh, the people, you know, the, the, the students I taught in China and the other foreign teachers that I've talked to about this experience, the college students say the same thing that you said about when I got to college, the handcuffs came off. Uh -huh. My parents were at there driving me right. so I could play games. I mean, satisfy all the hungers that my parents didn't really satisfy for me. Is, does, does that sort of make any sense? Uh, I, I think maybe I'm a little bit exception because I play a lot of games while I was, you know, under the custody. Uh, <laughs> basically, what happened is my dad is like, you want to play games? Fine. You play one hour game, you have to study one hour, which worked out quite well. Uh, but during high school, when I introduced game to my friends, one of them actually dropped out of school because he played too much. He doesn't have that self-control. Uh, I was talking to uh, Ge, he's not here today, about uh, you know, a, a book I read uh, written by a Chinese guy, but he was born in America, and he was writing 
how the Asian parents are behave very similarly, regardless of whether they are Korean or J Japanese or Chinese. Uh, one big problem I see, which I believe in, is that there's a different value here in America. The American value is very individual, right, uh, independent. And so when you retire, you're supposed to take care of yourself. And the government policy is going to change your retirement plan a lot. So you care about the government policy, you care about your own performance. But in Asia, for Japan for example, the most people are recruited by this huge corporation and they take care of your retirement by pension. So Japanese people are very proud about their companies. But in China, for thousands of years, your retirement plan is supposed to be your kid. And I mentioned earlier, when you are the only kid, your parents want to make sure their retirement is well invested, you know, and they want to make sure that's well taken care of. And, and because of that, there's a competition, you know, we are all single child from family, we all want to be the best. But what happens is when the Asian parents tell their kids, this is from the book, about what is good for them, it's always about stability, it's always about economical stability. Uh, so if you look into the Asian community here, most of the kids' top three jobs, lawyers, you know, doctor, engineers. And that's just like a common, common thing. Okay. Okay. Uh, a fantastic presentation. And uh, I think it is very interesting for you to incorporate the deep, uh, types of eight uh, different kinds of emotional experiences through your game. But also I'm curious, uh, based on your experience, uh, what kind of emotions are relatively easier for you to create or to incorporate in the game? What kind of emotional, exper emotional experiences are relatively you know, harder, difficult for you to create? I mean, the easiest is emotions that already existed. You know, if you want to make a racing game, you know, have a sense of thrill, there's a lot of games you can look up to, you can copy. Uh, when I work on these games, I still pick the relatively easier one. If you look at Flower or Journey, the emotion is very abstract. You know, um, I came from cinema school, so people always ask me, why don't you write an elaborate script, a good story to put in the game? I said, well, it's a little bit too ahead of its time because the game design, the interactive design, does not have that nuance yet. So what a story bring to a medium? You know, a film doesn't need a story, right? Film can just be abstract motion graphics, but why do people always use story today? Because film is so nuanced today. Like in the same genre, two movies can be quite different because of a very detailed change. Um, so I'll give you an example. If I want to make a happy game, Super Mario is pretty happy, right? And, <laughs> okay, uh, but if you want to make sure you want to have, have a very specific happiness, like let's say uh, a 12 years old boy who haven't seen his dad for seven years, when his dad is returned from war, how happy the kid is. You can't capture that through some simple interaction. You need to rely on the concept of character, relatable story, history, to really grasp that detail, that particular happiness. Um, and I just think, you know, uh, interactive design isn't quite there yet to capture such detailed nuance. Uh, so that's the territory which I'm not entering right now. Do you have uh, statistics around where your games are the most popular in the theater or in Asia or others? And uh, can you say a little bit about your company, you know, how many people that are working for you and what's your next uh, big game? Okay, uh, so Flow was, you know, initially it was six million people around the world. At the time, uh, it was three guys who made the game. Uh, it was particularly popular uh, in America and Russia. I think it was because some Russia gaming site really featured our game. Uh, they're, they're Europe, but when we actually launched Flow on the PlayStation, because it's a launch game, it was the number one game in Japan. 
and in America, but number three in Europe. Uh, when we launched Flower, we were like, this is going to be more popular in Japan, right? No, it doesn't. Like, the sales of Flower is less than Flow, but Flower is so popular in Europe. Like, the sales in Europe is more than America. Uh, Flower actually break the sales record in America and Europe. And then we launched Journey. It's like a revenge <laughs> from Japan. The sales of Journey is like 10 times higher than, you know, the flow sales. It's like Japanese love it. I think it's because Journey is about struggle, hardship, and somehow they re relate to it more. But America and Europe are also breaking sales records, so they are all very popular. So I would say Journey is probably the most universal game. Um, the whole company is very small. Uh, Flower is about nine to twelve people, and Journey is sorry, Flower is seven to twelve. Journey is nine to fourteen. Okay. And also, if you do make that move in the future, uh, do you see sort of the lack of uh, visual and, uh, and audio experiences that's inherent in the mobile platforms uh, having a negative effect on the interactive experience that uh, your games are uh, so good at? Uh, you can, I can make a well a talk about this, but uh, yeah, uh, I'm interested in that space, particularly because the iPads <laughs> right now the new iPad 3 uh, actually is more powerful or equally powerful compared to a PlayStation Portable. Uh, so you can pretty much do everything you do, what I showed, um, iPhone or iPad or Android phone. In fact, more Android phone are using even faster graphics card these days. Uh, so the future will be very interesting. What I want to comment on the mobile market, uh, even some of the Facebook games, is that they remind me of gaming in the very early days when arcade was popular. At the time, it was not about art. It was not about entertainment. It was about figuring out the optimal strategy to make the customer pay. And today's Facebook game and mobile game reminds me of those early arcade days. And I felt really heartbreaking. It's, it's like stepping backwards. You know, with all these academic awards and the industry things, you know, it, it's not happening on this much bigger market. And hopefully I can do some change to that market as well here. <laughs>